Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Citrus, the research exchange talk. I'm Camille Crittenden. I'm deputy director of Citrus and also uh, direct the Connected Communities Initiative here at Citrus. So um, we're really pleased to welcome uh, Professor Kevin Healy to be our speaker this afternoon. A couple of upcoming events I want to let you know about. We are launching a new seminar series similar to this one um, in Silicon Valley at the UC Santa Cruz Silicon Valley campus in Santa Clara. So that will be a monthly event um, starting March 1st with a conversation between Citrus Director Costa Spanos and Tom Siebel of C3 IoT. Um, so that promises to be a really exciting um, event to, to launch this new monthly series that will feature various citrus researchers often in conversation or on a panel together with leaders from industry and other organizations down in Silicon Valley. I am really pleased to uh, welcome Kevin Healy to be our speaker today. Um, Professor Healy, you'll see the um, the name of his distinguished professorship, he's been in the Department of Bioengineering and was its chair for four years between 2011 and 2015. Um, he and his lab uh, have done really remarkable work joining together biology and systems with um, new materials and material science that he will tell us about, as you can tell from the title, um, and the applications of some of this amazing research for new drug discovery, disease modeling, and precision medicine. So please join me in welcoming Professor Healy to the stage. Thank you. It's a pleasure uh, to be here. Um, it's nice to speak on campus. I guess I get invited to speak all over the world, and I can't remember the last time I spoke on campus. So, And I definitely didn't approach this topic. I'm going to start off with my disclosures. I have to tell you about these. There they are. OK, good. Um, <laughs> campus requires me to do that. Uh, the one that's relevant is this company we started called Organos. Uh, so I want to talk about the drug discovery problem. And before I tell you the problem, I want to tell you about how drugs are actually developed and discovered. And so you might see on the slide, you start out with somewhere between 5,000 and 10,000 drugs in essentially the synthetic scheme, nominally produced by you know, medicinal and synthetic chemists. They produce these drugs, and then somebody has to start to look at them and, and reduce the number as you move towards more clinically relevant applications. So in these preclinical studies, usually you see, I'll pass these things around uh, in a bit, you see these sort of what we call in vitro dish models. So that's what's shown here, where you put cells in these dishes, and you basically expose the drug uh, those cells to the drug, and you look at some sort of functional response. And then that moves to preclinical animal studies. In this case, I'm just showing a, a small rat. Um, and if, if it gets cleared, you might move uh, about five of them to a phase one clinical trial. The phase one clinical trial, you'll notice at the bottom, that's the number of patients. So that might have anywhere from 20 to 100 patients. And I think, I think this will become a point we'll, we'll get to throughout the presentation that you can see that that's probably too small, right, to really assess the effect of drug on a wide patient population, like just what we have in this room, for example. So uh, what you do in the phase one trial is just look for safety. Is this thing really uh, doing anything wrong to the patients? And, and typically, because of the size of these trials are so small, you progress to the phase two and phase three trials. Then you go through FDA review and manufacturing, and this all, whole thing relates to this problem, which is you start with five to 10,000 drugs and you get one at the end, right? And so, well, why is that a problem? The problem is it takes a long time. It can take anywhere from nine to 15 years to develop a new drug, and the cost can be substantial on the order of five billion, with a B, uh, per new drug, right? A lot of this cost, you might think, is in the clinical trials, but really, a lot of it comes and encompasses what we call this sort of preclinical development phase and maybe early clinical trials. And if I were to draw a graph of where drugs fail, well, they sort of are out here and they kind of get better and better and better, and it's okay. And then it's right in this phase you take a dip because you change between these patient populations. I will say that a lot of this preclinical work is not even done on human cells, it's done on animal cells, and I'll explain why that's a problem. Uh, in a moment. Okay, so here's another way of looking at the problem. Um, the number of new drugs in a two-year span between 
1999 and 2001 was about 29. Uh, FDA approves these are new medical uh, entities or, or new molecular entities, excuse me. So that's a new drug. Uh, if you go to 2009 to 2011, about, about 2011, about the same amount of, uh, of drugs. But look, you've almost doubled the uh, industrial spending or global R&D spending, and you've doubled the number of companies basically in the game. So uh, drugs are becoming more expensive to produce and basically less efficiently, and more companies are trying to do this. So who's familiar with basically Moore's Law? Almost everybody in this room, right? We're in a electrical engineering building, right? Well, this little catchy thing that you could see uh, is E-Room's Law, and that's the inverse of Moore's Law, or just the fact that uh, in the drug discovery world, yes, you're supposed to laugh, right? Uh, number of drugs per billion uh, US dollars spent. So you, know, you could see in the 60s we were way up here, and now we're just cratering down, cratering down, cratering down. If this extends out, we extrapolate this out, you know, somewhere in like 2023, 20, we won't be able to s even create one drug, new drug, that would uh, cost less than a billion dollars, right? And, and we could talk about in the Q&A that why that's a big problem. Okay, so why do drugs fail? So you take that drug, you uh, basically put it in these little dishes we, 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 we use for cell culture. Cells are at the bottom. Most of these cells are non-human, but even if you use uh, human cells, we call this a two-dimensional, 2D dish model. Uh, this is not equivalent to an animal, and even though an animal, basically these cute little rats, they might want to behave like humans and have pets, uh, they're not like humans, and they, they have physiological differences that we, uh, we, we know about, uh, but we use them, or the field uses them, for this drug discovery process. And, and so, uh, and that should also be clear, that they're not basically the same as, as humans. So, um, I like flames, people that have seen me present before, so flames are for emphasis. That's when you're digging into your salad and not really paying attention, and you see something flame. It's like, that's a good thing to pay attention to. So, okay, so preclinical, these preclinical 2D models fail to capture the complexity of three-dimensional tissue. So there's a, there's a tissue mis mismatch. There's like these thin cells on a plate, or you can grab basically a piece of your tissue and, and say, hey, that's a little bit different, right? It's a 3D functioning connected uh, 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 grouping of cells and, and matrix. And then uh, the second issue is that Many diseases that we might want to treat don't have good preclinical models. So, so the biologists are really creative in getting to the point where they can create animal models of certain diseases, but this takes a long time, right? And, and so there are some decent models, but, but, but certainly rare diseases and other uh, patient-specific aspects are not going to be captured in these genetically uh, defined uh, preclinical models. Okay, so now how do drugs fail? So you can just see this big red red part here, safety, toxicity, liver and the heart. Uh, you might wonder what these other things are. Well, a strategic means 17% uh, of the drugs are taken out of the pipeline because the company just decided they either weren't going to make money or that you know basically wasn't going to uh, handle the particular clinical ac application that they uh, originally proposed. And this happens when a company gets approval, but it's black boxed. And you, you see this all the time, right? You're watching commercial for whatever treatment of a drug, and then there's some man or woman with a voice that speaks really fast, and it gives you like 40 different diseases you could you know, have or, or, or side effects you could have with the drug, including death, right? And you're like, why would I take that, right? And so, so the black boxing is basically a strategic, and then efficacy means it just really didn't work that well, right? And, and uh, so that's, that's what happens. So uh, I'll talk about being Valentine's Day. This is appropriate. I'll talk about the heart. Uh, most of my uh, focus in the lab is in on cardiovascular uh, aspects of, of uh, one way or another treatment of disease. We do have some other programs I'll discuss at the end that are relevant to, to, this, to this particular field. But uh, we really want to think about every drug that's made, doesn't matter what it's used for, has to first prove it doesn't affect your cardiac rhythm. Why is that? Because if it alters your cardiac rhythm and causes what we call arrhythmia, right? This could be an unnatural heartbeat and, and rapidity of that, that uh, beating. Uh, this uh, obviously is a no-go or a non-starter for the drug. And this is where a lot of those drugs, when we go from 10,000 to 250, a lot of them are screened and the attrition occurs 
in that phase. And so you generate, in many ways, you generate false positives and false negatives under these conditions. And so this is an image I took at the British Museum. It was probably from here to the wall of just all these little drug tablets lined up. There was an artist's impression of what society is doing in terms of consuming drugs and vitamins and so forth. But, but all, the, all, all the clinically uh, prescribed drugs have to go through this uh, uh, aspect of identifying whether just patients might have uh, related arrhythmia. And as I said, this is first done in these 2D dish models, right? And then it goes into animal models. And it can go all the way through clinical trials, or I'm sorry, preclinical trials before it even touches human cells. Right, that's, that's a problem, okay? And this uh, thing, toisade de point, or twisting of points, is just a description that they use for this pro-induction uh, of arrhythmia, or pro-arrhythmia, it's called. Uh, and that's related to the aspect of the drug actually causing alterations in the waveform of what you would probably know from the doctor, or, or maybe uh, primary school, or wherever you learned about the EKG. Uh, we'll show you examples of that that we can measure in the lab. Okay, so we're not the only one trying to do this. There's a lot of folks trying to make tissue models, and uh, especially for cardiac tissue, and I'm not going to explain what these are on the, the screen. I will say that this is where Moore's Law comes in, that um, in many ways, this is like a tissue culture plate. I'll sort of pass this around. Uh, basically, this has 12 wells. Uh, you could see that this is not really a high throughput kind of system, and so if you're trying to screen hundreds of drugs, this is maybe not the best strategy to use. And some of these images that you're seeing of, of cardiac tissue, I'll call them tissue equivalents, uh, uh, go in this kind of format, right? And then you could see maybe you can get more than that. You can get 10 to 30 on a plate, and that still doesn't really handle the problem. What you really want to get to is basically something following Moore's Law, where in this format, because the whole industry is based on what we call this 96 well plate format, this dimension, uh, how many can we basically samples that uh, sort of recapitulate the, the uh, uh, aspects of cardiac structure onto a, a chip space? And so, yes, you all know Moore's Law, and what, what happens here is this increased computational power was achieved by basically downscaling and parallelization of the systems. This doesn't really happen in biology. You could see that's not happening here, right? This, this is a pretty large format. Why is that important? I'll get to it in a moment, but the, the real issue is cost, right? The, the supplies to actually do the studies from the cells and the media become expensive, and in, in you'll see, see why in a moment, right? So what do we do in our lab? We take this idea of microfabrication, which you can do here in the Marvel, basically, laboratory, or you could go where we go is the Bio Nanotechnology Center in Stanley Hall. That's what we call the BNC, and that's where we do most of our, our microfabrication. Uh, we can combine it with induced uh, pluripotent stem cells, but notice human. So these are human cells. These are, these are stem cells from adults I'll describe in a moment, and they carry the patient's genetic uh, background, healthy or diseased. So that, right away, can make you start to think like, well, okay, I can get to sort of patient-specific medicine because I could make these cells from everyone in the room if somebody gave me enough money and, and personnel to do that. And we could, we could carry those genetic traits that you have into these stem cells. And then we can actually produce them into tissue type cells or tissue specific cells like these, these cardiac cells I'll describe. So what can these things do? So I'm going to pass this around and I'll talk a little bit more about it. This is um, one of our micro devices, there's actually two in the chip. You won't really even see it. You'll just see a couple of holes, and, and that gives you an idea of how small it is relative to this. And the cells sit, if you look at this, the cells will sit in this micro device between basically the two blue markers, and the orange one is how we load the cells. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give this, sorry to interrupt your lunch, but you can pass that around. Okay. So, all right, so what do these things do? Well, we think uh, these things on the far right for you, they de-risk basically development. It de-risks R&D costs, reduces time. Those are all important. This is one that, that you know, this is a public uh, interest move, which is uh, thinking about refined and reduced animal use. And this is a big topic in, in the drug pharma uh, area, as well as disrupt the pharma pipeline. 
Okay, why induce pluripotent stem cells? Well, I already mentioned they have biologic and racial diversity. Uh, what are they? Well, basically, you could take uh, a biopsy of a somatic cell. For those of you that know what that is, let's just say I take a little biopsy. People, inner muscle, people are trying to make this from saliva and urine, these cells. But let's just take, I take a biopsy of cells. So it comes from an adult. And then this is uh, an image that's courtesy or a video courtesy of our colleagues at Gladstone. Uh, these cells naturally differentiate into different cell types. And Shinya Namanaka received the Nobel Prize where these get genetically reprogrammed. So they go back to the stem cell state. And then you can see this is like an energy landscape, right? So it's good for maybe engineering and scientists to think about. And what creates that energy landscape, these valleys that, that cause this undifferentiated cell to move to something like a heart cell is the composition of the media like what's in the media and what drives this cell in a certain direction to become a heart cell, to become a blood vessel, brain cells, and skin cells. The beauty of this and why this was a Nobel Prize discovery is that these cells can be propagated almost indefinitely. So in the lab, we can keep making more and more and more and more and more once we have that biopsy from the patient, right? And so then it's just a matter of figuring out the cocktail that provides us energy landscape to get to here. Fortunately for cardiac cells, this is pretty well known, right? And, and folks in my lab spend a lot of time doing this and, and, and essentially are, are quite successful in getting these cardiac cells. So, so the cardiac cells, in a sense, uh, are just one of any cell type you might want to make in the body. And, and uh, I would say that different research programs are at different states in trying to make cells of specific tissue, like different types of neurons. Ret uh, cells in your retina, so forth and so on. Okay, so where does the microfabrication come in? Well, if you look at uh, normal tissue, let's just say under the microscope, this might be what a muscle looks like. This is the basically the cardiomyocyte cells. This is what they might look like. So this is you know physiological arrangement. You might say there's some orientation going in this direction. And then if I just take these cells and put them on a dish, they're kind of looking like this, right? There's nothing to organize those cells. They might be cardiomyocytes, and they might be functional cells, like you see in other tissues, but they're, they're not organized, right? So they lose structural orientation. And you could think about it this way. You know, when we drive down the road, we stay between the lines. Like, we have some behavior, right? Uh, if there was no lines and there was a big open field, we'd be driving anywhere. Like, I don't know, people running around in a parking lot and driving around in a parking lot, right? There's no, no orientation, there's no guidance for these cells. There's certainly orientation and guidance in these cells. So if we take something that promotes this kind of guidance, we think we move to this sort of, sort of classic definition of, of or, or schematically defining what's wrong with the drug discovery process. That is that, that the sort of Parthenon or, or structure here is only supported by one pillar. And that one pillar is these animal studies, right? And, and the movement, the new movement, is to now have this, this, this house, if you will, supported by two pillars. And the two pillars essentially give you support. But we made it clear in this, in this review that we don't want these basically to cross compare. Because this is an independent data set that the F FDA uh, uh, will use to regulate drug basically approval. And we want this to become one as well. If we keep cross comparing to these two, and this might be a point of discussion uh, in the Q&A, then we're basically uh, uh, always linked to these animal studies, which we know are inaccurate and fail. So why would we continually link ourselves to something we know is inadequate, right? So this is the rationale behind uh, this, this strategy and this, this, this sort of uh, schematic. OK, more flames. So then the question should be, uh, the, in your mind, is like, well, how small can you make these things? Well, we're passing around something that's pretty small. I actually can't see the little thing in there. I'll describe what that little thing is and, and dimensions and how we got there. I sort of said this already, but I want to make sure um, it, it's really hit home with respect to understanding that every material has structure, property, performance relationships. Those that have taken undergraduates take E45, and you, you, you've seen that, that, that structure, right? It's a common one in material science. And that is usually used for synthetic materials, like metals, plastics, you know, so forth. But in reality, 
biology, the tissues in biology also have structure and also behave this relationship. So if we look at the heart, we take a little piece of the heart. You can see there's some orientation of the fibers that cause this muscle to actually look like this. This is the tip here. And it's actually, if you took like a, a band or a towel, usually describe this, and you twist it, that's kind of the, uh, uh, the structural uh, alignment of these cardiomyocytes within the heart. So these are the cell nuclei. You can, uh, cell bodies are hard to see, but I hope you get the impression that the cells are aligned in this fashion, right? And so what we did is said, okay, let's make a microfabricated system, a microfluidic system, and we'll describe that part in a moment, that constrains the cells immediately and has the structural dimensions of the human heart. And so this is what the tissue would look like on the histological section. This is a scanning electron micrograph where the cells have been uh, taken out by a decellularization cocktail, and then you're just left with protein matrix. And it's these collagen protein fibers that you could see band the cells, give you the dimensions, so 150 microns, a little bit larger than uh, the thickness of your hair, one of your, you know, basically human hair, right? So it's pretty small. Right? And so this is what happens and how this tissue gets organized. And so you know, our hypothesis at the time when we first did this about five or six years ago was this alignment affects cell-cell contacts, which are very important, electrical activity, and the contraction within this three-dimensional three tissue. And so this is where the microfabrication comes in. And what I'm passing around, maybe you could see it. This is actually the, 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 the elastomer that it's called polydimethylsiloxate. It's PDMS for short. This is like what you're seeing. It's just one of these fashion. And then the cells just sit in this little portion. This is for fluid to flow. It comes from one side or the other and flows through this, this system. I'll show you that in, in, in scale here. So you think of this about 150 microns. Cells are loaded into this cell part of the chip. And then these red uh, channels, those are what we call endothelial cell channels, or we call those basically mock blood vessels, right? And so they're providing what a cell would need to survive, oxygen, nutrient exchange, clearance. And this occurs, I'll show you these in a moment, occurs through diffusion only, much like in the body where there's another cell layer between the cardiac tissue and the blood vessels, right? And then I won't say much about these today, but we have pillars that are, are deflected to measure force, and then electrodes that measure uh, field potential. I'll, I'll talk about some other electrical recordings in a moment. So we're really interested in this part here, electrophysiology, because as I stated, all drugs have to be screened for their uh, ability or, or basically inability to affect the cardiac rhythm, and uh, particularly ventricular. So if we take this idea and we make this channel, I already said what its dimensions are. This is basically now in the media channels. This is a little bit higher uh, blow up of this area. These are little fenestrations. They're about two microns in, in width. And basically fluid flows through these. And then through diffusion, you get nutrients and everything into that cell chamber. What is really important, though, is this, that the volume of, of uh, fluid and media that uh, exposes and the cells are bathed with is essentially much more physiologic than whoever has the dish. If you pick it up, if you might recall, there might be a, a, a number of cells and a very high volume layer. I'll show you an example later on. Um, so it's, it's a non-physiological representation. It'd be like us being flooded in a pool of water in this room when really we only need about basically a gallon or two of water. Right for to bathe us in terms of the cell volume, so that that ratio isn't right in normal, basically tissue culture, but it does become more realistic in these systems. And so, then I, I sort of put these two images on. I won't explain really so much what's going on here. It's just a, just basically the cells are in the chip. These are the cardiomyocytes you're seeing in the video. They're actually contracting. The little red lines. Are, is a, just an optical, basically, mapping technique that we developed in the lab that tells you the magnitude and the direction the cells are moving. And you should be able to see that these cells are going like this, right, if you follow those vectors. But if you look over here, what's happening? They're not going in a line like this, right? Or in, in, we would call this the x direction, as we define it. They're actually just beating everywhere, right? 
and, and they almost don't beat synchronously. This they beat synchronously. So the, the issue here comes down to this, this question of structure and the issue of how important is it? Very important. We can decouple basically an X uh, uh, contraction and a Y contraction and then calculate the speed of contraction so, and then create heat maps. So you can see most of the contraction is in this direction for this image and basically not in the Y direction for this, for this sample. This would be totally, uh, basically, it would be uh, contracting both in the X and Y direction. This is what you see in your classic 2D cell culture. So if, if we're exposing these cells to now uh, drugs, I wouldn't expect the same response from this group that I see from this group, right? I'd expect a different response, and that's, and that's entirely what, what ends up happening. So uh, this promotes cell maturity. Um, I'm just gonna maybe just tell you quickly, this is a nice little video. Uh, if these things sit on a microscope stage, this is what it looks like off the microscope. Drug is introduced into the system. This is all real time. This is a fluorescent probe, and it just shows you how this lights up Basically, the, this is an empty chip, but the cells would be, be sitting here. And then we record different things. Like I said, beat rate is one of the things we're interested. The electrical activity can come in what's called an action potential. That's what this is. Or something, a field potential with an electrode. And it, they, they record the same thing, this QT interval, which is the same thing that you have in your EKG, or electrocardiogram, that you would, would, would receive at the doctor's office. Um, but they, they, they look different because of how you record these. This is with an optical probe, and this is with basically uh, uh, an electrode. And then also calcium dynamics. This is kind of a nice image because you see this blinking, almost looks like a blinking traffic light, and that's a genetically encoded uh, uh, reporter for basically the calcium transient. So what happens is right after the action potential, there's a calcium transient, and what, what is really happening, and I don't want to get too much in the weeds on this, but I just want you to understand that the cell, if you don't do a lot of uh, uh, basically uh, research or think about cell biology much, you, you see the cell has a membrane and it has these ion channels, and what happens when this, this action potential starts, you have an influx of things like sodium, and then slowly outflux to things like calcium, so you get a rapid depolarization and then it slowly hits this plateau, and then basically it goes down depending on sodium, potassium, calcium influx. And, and there are multiple ion channels. We look at about, about uh, six to, to 12 of these uh, in, and seeing how drugs affect these. So if a drug slows one of these ion channels, you might extend this plateau or you might shorten it. And both of those could have different effects on, on the tissue. So here's the first quiz. So we've given the chips um, this, this one drug, isoproteranol, which is a beta uh, adrenergic agonist. So it speeds up beating. So which of these is actually beating faster? Who says the left one? Who says the right one? OK, you all get A's. OK, okay good. All right, yeah, so uh, this one's going about 124 beats, 55. Basically, we just normalize that. And the way this sort of works is we introduce that drug, as I showed you. Uh, we define, this is sort of the concentration. It's called the estimated therapeutic plasma concentration. This is the concentration that would be in a patient's blood of taking the medicine. And then we want to know, at this inflection point, what this ratio is of this concentration to this, because it defines the safety margin. And that's, what, that's really what you're after in drug discovery and drug development. That safety margin has to be somewhere in the order of about 15 to 20 in that ratio. If this gets too close, I'll show you an example in, in a couple of slides, then the, the drug's on the edge. And then you have to do a lot of things to figure out to get this, this drug to, to, to work properly. Okay. So uh, isopaternal is an easy example. It actually turns out to be, have a really nice safety margin. Um, Let's look at this one. This is, this is the 2D dish you have, and in it you have one of these cardiac MPS systems. These are just different electrodes, but, but that's not so important. And so the, the blue is for basically the 2D experiment, and you can see this particular drug actually stops or, 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 or stops the, the cells from beating or the, the tissue chip from beating. But that concentration occurs at a much higher, this is log scale, a much higher concentration when we're in the cardiac MPS, and it's the same cells in the system. So now we're not 
sort of arguing whether we're using animal cells or human cells. Uh, we're looking at the difference between basically the format and the structure of these cells in the system. And if you, if you look at this and we make that same uh, calculation of safety margin, you could see this one is right at the, basically the concentration. So there's no safety margin by using this example. But by using the MPS, there's a large safety margin. And what does this say? Case study, eliminating false positives. The false positive is probably the bane of, of the pharmaceutical industry. The false positive, basically the attrition of false positive is much higher than false negative. Because false negatives made it through many different studies before typically the negativity, if you will, comes up in the late clinical trial with a subset of the population, not, not, not you know, a, a, a small cohort. So, so the attrition of all the, quote, good drugs, like this one called verapamil, uh, where does it say verapamil? should say verapamil, ah, verapamil. Um, this is uh, clinically uh, prescribed for uh, just, just decades, very low incidence of arrhythmia. But if I believe this experiment, I would say that, that I would have chucked this drug out as basically a, 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 a screen, in a screen that it wouldn't have passed, right? And so when I calculate those safety ratios, you could see something like three would not pass. That's for the 2D experiment. But for the, we call this microphysiological system, so the cardiac chip, we see that it's, it's robust and it would certainly pass that screen. And this is just running a little bit uh, over maybe where I want to be in time. So I'll just say that um, that story is captured here and that the cardiac MPS, if you will, or the cardiac chip, even reports what's considered one of the classic experiments, a pig uh, papillary muscle or an animal, piece of an animal heart. And you could see this is how this drug was essentially rescued by showing that even though it might have failed the 2D dish, it gets appropriate safety margins when you look at animal tissue. The problem is you sacrificed a pig and wasted a lot of money uh, when this could have been done uh, in a dish, right? Maybe not 20 years ago, but currently, you can do this experiment with, with the, the type of methodology and workflow I just mentioned using these induced pluripotent stem cells. And I'll just, I'll just mention the false negative. Here's a good example of false negative. This is just what I just told you. Uh, this, this example is just showing you the 2D dish is this black line. So if we give a concentration, there's no response. And we just pass this on and say, hey, look, there's a nice safety margin here between basically the onset of this drug, uh, alpha -tosin. <coughs> Um, and, and then if you really look at the, the MPS, which is, I'll just pick this blue one, blue line, you'll see that uh, the safety margin is kind of right at the inflection point. And that's interesting because uh, this is a false negative in the screen, but we know clinically this does create a few of these uh, twasad, the points are, are a few arrhythmias. So, so this, this is a good example of the prediction of this, of this, this MPS system. This is, I'm just showing you that it was done with the, this particular analysis was done with the calcium uh, reporter system. Okay, uh, that's probably as much technical detail I'm gonna give you this afternoon. Uh, uh, basically, let's talk about what I just told you. What I did just now is a generic drug screen, which is I just took, you know, let's call it wild type or control <laughs> induced pluripotent stem cells from a patient, we know where that patient uh, we don't know who the patient is, but we know details of that patient. And that's interesting. But the real uh, capacity to exploit this technology comes in when we start to call precision medicine. So my colleague Joe Wu at Stanford says, well, what's precision medicine? And says, we can't agree on what it is. If you talk to the computational biologists, they say one thing. You talk about cell biologists, they say another. Um, but everybody has to do it because everybody else is doing it. So since we can't define it and we're all doing it, this is what we're gonna call today is precision medicine, which is using these MPS systems and technology to actually uh, do drug discovery. Maybe not on these patients, because they all are fine. Maybe these rare subjects that have some sort of adverse behavior to the exposure of the drug. And how can we do that? Well, we just collect a population of iPS cells from these patients, and we actually make the same system I just described, and actually then we run the chip assay with uh, those cells from these patients, and we get things like basically diseased uh, iPS, iPS cells from maybe these people have different diseases. 
they're screened, maybe they have a toxicity to the drug, and we can do all this with, with basically uh, different types of, of RNA uh, uh, analysis and RNA-seq analysis, which is a transcriptomic analysis of the patient's basically genetics and their, their, their gene expression. And, and of course, racial, gender, and age diversity. Age is an interesting part that I'll, I'll punt on till we get to um, the Q&A. And then, and then Gumby here is the you know, person with a very rare disease, right? And so you know, maybe you just want to start with those patients that we know have a rare disease and just start screening drugs with their cells because essentially we want to know how this drug is affecting a particular patient. Then we talk about disease modeling in this case, and the disease modeling is very, very simple. This patient who is now deceased had a, a ventricular uh, disease called long QT3 syndrome. Here's your EKG, it's extended. And you could see this is this extension, then this changes the, the, the length of the QT interval. This causes a, a, a basically ventricular arrhythmias. And um, uh, in the case we do have the patient's uh, uh, cells, and we've made them into cardiomyocytes, this is the QT interval. And what you could see is a concentration of that same drug, verapamil, can start to control that QT interval. This is about normal. Uh, range about 300 milliseconds without elevating the beat rate. But the concentration gets too high, then the patient has basically starts to generate arrhythmias and too high a beat rate, 300 beats per second, right? So all this can be done in the dish. This is an example of capturing the patient's, what we would say, phenotype in the dish and then essentially the MPS chip and then using it to, to, to screen drugs. And then I'll just, I'll just say, I want to get to the Q&A, so I'll just say something quickly about we do want to make multi-organ systems. Uh, that comes into looking at metabolic diseases like obesity and diabetes, and you can see this is on the cover of a major research journal, you know, what's happening to why this patient is overweight, and then what's happening, how these organs interact. And so we have programs with collaborators here on campus and at UCSF to make fat. So that's white adipose tissue, so instead of fat, it's actually wet. Um, but that's the one you're trying to get rid of, but don't get rid of all of it because you need it. It's actually an organ, and without it, you, you basically die. So you need fat, so uh, go have a nice, I don't know, Valentine's Day chocolate cake or something, uh, and feel, feel relieved that you can do something like that. And then the heart and the liver. Uh, these things need to be connected. I'll just tell you we've made methodology to connect them. We call these microorganos, like Legos, and these little pieces fit together. And this would be a format, like that 96-well format, that you could see how this system hangs together. And next, I'm trying to get to this so we have some time for Q&A. This is a, an interesting uh, experiment. So drug-drug interactions. These are normally not discussed and, and really not screened for. So uh, we, we, we have made now a liver chip. I won't tell you much about it. We gave this drug cisapride, 80 deaths, 500 uh, arrhythmias or tosa de point, prolongation of QT interval. This went all the way through clinical trials. Obviously, that's why patients died. Uh, but it was a certain part of the patient population that had a problem. And it occurred this way. It wasn't due to the cisapride itself. So if you look at the cisapride, this is just beats per minute. And if you look at basically if we expose the drug through the liver, it metabolizes the drug and it goes to the cardiac system, you get a nice response. Uh, if it gets too high, basically, and this is just the cardiac cells only, so it's non-metabolized drug, then you have a problem. So what was happening was patients were, sorry, patients were um, uh, uh, using a, a topical antifungal agent called ketoconazole. And so the, the doctor might have prescribed that, but wouldn't know how often that patient applied it. And what that does is it inhibits the liver from metabolizing the, 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 um, the drug, so you start to move into this direction. And this is a time course of how fast it happens. So the heart is behaving properly. Basically, the ketoconazole is introduced, and almost within about 10 minutes, you start to see the whole cardiac beat frequency crater. And this is what happened basically clinically. So we would argue if we had this kind of uh, uh, knowledge of drug-drug interaction, you would have black boxed basically cisapride and said, no, it can't be used with you know these topical agents like ketoconazole, right? And and that's that that has never been shown before in vitro. Okay, not everything works well. We do have heart failure in the lab. This students creatively put this up. Um, 
But I sort of said all these, and I'll, I'll, I'll go to the question and answer and just say, this is my sort of, let's think about this. We saw the slide when we started. We said, well, maybe the cardiac chip fits in here, but what about this? What if we, what if we could run clinical trials in the dish, right? What if we got rid of a large portion of clinical trials? Because in this room, I don't know how many people are here, maybe 40 or so, you know, that's already, if you go back, you know, that's already, you know, phase one clinical trial for safety, right? What if we could do that in the chip? And then I'll just stop and just say, um, there's a lot of other things that we can do with these things, organ storage, genome editing, uh, injury models, countermeasure threats, all those we're working on, microbiome, toxins, EPA, these are all important. And then I have to thank all the folks that did the work. Some of them are here. So uh, Brian, uh, Bernice, uh, Peter, uh, Willie May, Felipe, Kento, uh, and Nate, those who are a combination of postdocs and grad students that did all this work, Willie May too. And then a collaboration with Bruce Conklin at the Gladstone, which is where a lot of this brainstorming started. And then just our funding agencies. And with that, I'll stop and, and have a few minutes for questions. Thank you. So you talked about heart and liver versions of these organs on chip. How many uh, organs do we need to have before we can realistically start replacing animal trials? Yeah, that's a, a nice question. So um, it depends on what you're trying to do and what you're trying to think about in terms of the toxicity. So in one program, we're interested in liver, fat, and basically islet cells or basically beta cells as a metabolic syndrome chip. We think three might be enough there. Uh, if you want to extend a muscle, cardiac or skeletal muscle, uh, because diabetes, uh, well, influence of diabetes coordinates with, with skeletal and cardiac muscle, that, that might be a, a fourth. But you might see in the literature there's a push to put like 10 organs on a chip and four organs on a chip. And, I think those are misguided approaches. I think mean, you really have to think about why you would have more than one organ on the chip, because it gets very complex, right? We don't have good substitutes for blood that we would have to bathe both organs with. We know how to, sort of went through that quickly, but we know how to bathe the heart cells, and we know how to bathe the liver cells, but figuring out how, just how those two cells can s sustain their normal function with what we would call a common medium media, then that would be, um, that's something we've figured out, but that's a couple of years to do. And it would be harder once you extend to three, four, five organs. Yeah. So the idea is to rely on assumptions on what the drug might affect in order to decide which organ systems we go to? That's right. And it's not always perfect because a lot of these drugs that are pulled or basically have a lot of attrition with uh, uh, proarrhythmia, they're not focused on heart treatment. Right? Some are, some are, and it's ironic that ones that are meant to control arrhythmia actually cause arrhythmia, right? But, but you can take like the alphazosin, which is more for prostate enlargement. It has nothing to do with the heart, but you basically um, you know, are concerned with that getting too high a concentration that it could affect the heart. Um, my question is, uh, there's a lot of work going on right now using circulating tumor cell CTCs outside of the patient's body in vitro testing. Are you looking at any diagnostic applications similar to that for your process, similar, separate from the drug testing? Yeah, we're, we're, it's a really good question. I actually should have put, you know, that, that this slide needs oncology to, to be added to it, because they're not our group personally, but many groups are, are working on tumor models, in vitro tumor models. We, you would call them assays, but they're more complex than just an assay. They, they, can, they can have vascularization, and you can see how you know, different cells leave the vascularization, vascular system, if you will, and then actually attack the tumor. Right? Uh, in a project that is in our lab, um, we are looking at um, the incidence of chemotherapy drugs to affect basically the heart and, and cause cardio cardiomyopathy. This is 
uh, something that happens in, with breast cancer patients and other patients, that the cardiomyopathy is introduced after exposure to basically the chemotherapy agent. So we're screening that, and that's a little bit different because that's more of a structural change, not not a, not an electrophysiology change. So uh, Bernice is working on you know getting accurate recordings of of uh, pillars in those cases. But uh, we planned a breast cancer chip at one point, and I suppose. Uh, we got so caught up in just getting this to work, <laughs> it's, it's down the line, but, but it's, a, it's, it's certainly possible. And, um, you know, we, we was at a meeting in Germany where we talked about uh, a CAR-T type chip where you could try to see how these cells go and move around. So it's, it's, it's technically possible. It's just a matter of, of getting the details right. Uh, thank you for the super interesting talk and the wonderful work you do. Um, this also probably takes you a little bit into the future log of things to do, but um, you illustrated a little bit how you're starting to put organ models in chains. Um, and the question basically goes, is there a sweet spot that you're aiming for, or goals that you have in terms of increasing the complexities of these? In the beginning, you showed that the real heart tissue moves differently than this kind of channeled version that you had. Um, and along with that, as you increase the parameter spaces, how is automation processing um, progressing on, on having larger arrays of these manufactured and automatically run and things like that? I just want to make sure I was clear. The, the, the two beating images, the one on the right, was from a dish, not from natural heart. Oh, okay. So, so I was trying to point out that the chip would be much better. <laughs> oh, so, sorry about that. No, that's okay. <laughs> uh, but the question is a very good one, or, or a series of questions. Let's take uh, technology you know, advancement. I mean, we, re we really want to get to, um, to, to this, sorry, to, to this system where we start to get into the Moore's Law phase and really get you know, hundreds of these chips onto a plate. You can see right now the format isn't that way because, because until we prefer perfect the chip, there's no reason to basically downscale it and, and, and get it right. But once we're at that point, we certainly want to do that. That would incorporate uh, automation and imaging to actually look at each chip within certain you know, time, time sequences. It would, uh, we'd have to think about uh, uh, electronically activating and pacing these cells. And then uh, also um, robotic handlers, there's th they've been made where you can actually put the the whole systems into incubators that sits in an enclosure. This can all be automated at some point. That just relies on colleagues in this building and across the street and so on and so forth to get to get the job done. Thank you.